Let's, let's go back to Luke 16. I, I mentioned this morning that, um, that I would probably uh, just do some more of what's in my notes concerning hell and what all the Bible says about it. Um, and I, I mean it. Um, social media... People you follow on the internet or videos you watch on the internet. Um, I remember there was this one guy and he, he was sort of an outdoorsman. Handy with his hands. He was good with an axe. And he would make all can kinds of things, you know, out of wood. Things that he cut down out of the forest. I like, I like stuff like that. Uh, seemed like a decent guy raising his family, you know, out in the mountains somewhere, trying to live somewhat of a self-subsistence lifestyle. Nothing wrong with that at all. I, I admire people that can do that. Um, I still like my McDonald's fries every now and then. So, uh, but anyway, I won't give the name of his, of his uh, YouTube channel, but he seemed like a nice guy. And I started watching him, and he would talk about God and things like that. And I'm going, great, this, this guy's a Christian. And then I see that he made a video, him and I, I don't know if it was the pastor of the church he went to or whatever, but, um, yeah, it's, my mic is on. I'm getting a text saying my mic's not on. It's on. Okay. <clears throat> so anyway, uh, him and whoever he was with, they were making a video and they were going to correct everybody who's wrong about hell. And, um, and usually when I see that, that automatically tells me nine times out of ten, they're going to teach a false doctrine about hell. And the only way you can do that if you, take, if you take a King James Bible and you're going to teach false doctrine on hell, pretty much the only way you can do that is to take the Hebrew and the Greek words and retranslate them or use, use the etymology of those words or use the historical context of how other Greek literature used this word Hades, which is the Greek, one of the Greek words for hell, and, and apply it that way and say, this is what God really meant. This is how they understood it back then. I don't buy that. Hell is hell. It is a place of eternal, everlasting punishment for sinners who die in a condemned state. That's what it's for. It is permanent. There is no respite. There are no vacations from or vacations to hell. Once you are there, and, and when I say hell, I also interchange that with the lake of fire, which is mentioned in Isaiah 66 and in, in the book of Revelation. And I'll, I'll touch on that here just shortly. Um, but that's what it is. And anybody who, like I say, they, they, you see a title of some video, The Real Truth About Hell. Things your pastor won't teach you about hell. They like to get your attention with stuff like that. Those are attention. And nothing makes me madder than a misleading title on a YouTube video. You watch it and you find out it has nothing to do with what the title said. That, the, it, 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 YouTube, if you're going to strike people, strike them for that. Ugh. Anyway. So let's read this story in Luke 16. In, in the, in the t entire context, the entirety of what it says, and uh, then we'll move from there. Um, let's see here. It starts in verse 19. 
And Jesus doesn't even say that this is a parable. He doesn't say that. It doesn't say, and he taught them a parable saying, Jesus just says, there was a certain rich man. So the implication is, there really was this man who was rich, and there was a beggar outside of his gates by the name of Lazarus. Now we're not told if this is the same Lazarus that he raised from the dead. We don't know that. Um, but anyway, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am, that is a present tense, is right now, I am tormented in this flame. There is nothing hard about this sentence. There's nothing to misunderstand. There's no great mysterious wisdom that you can pull out of this. This man is standing in the midst of a raging, flaming fire in severe pain and he is going to he has remained that way for 2000 years so far he will remain that way until the day of the great white throne judgment where he will be given his resurrection body, this is called the resurrection of the damned or the doomed. He will be resurrected, stand in judgment, and then cast into the lake of fire. The similarity would be if you got arrested for a serious crime and you were held in jail without bond awaiting your trial, uh, Jeffrey Epstein, okay? With all his millions, $500 million estate is what he left behind. With all his millions of dollars, that could not get him out of jail because they knew that he was a flight risk. And they knew that he had friends in very high places and that if they let him out of jail, they would never find him again. Now, the only thing his money did for him was buy him protection because he would use the money that he had to buy commissary for great big burly husky thugs that would give him protection. Okay, but apparently somebody paid somebody more to talk him into committing suicide, which I, I don't know if I can even say that on YouTube anymore. Anyway, I don't believe it. But anyway, uh, where was I going with that? Yeah, the, the equivalent is you are held in jail until the time of your trial, then you are found guilty. And upon being found guilty, you are then taken in chains to the prison to serve the rest of your sentence. Um, when they give people, let's say somebody murdered, uh, I'll use Chris Watts. He's the man in Colorado that just murdered his, and I didn't know this. But I watched a documentary on him the other day. 
He murdered his wife after a fight they got into because she knew that he had been having an affair. He choked her to death, wrapped her body up in the bed sheets, carried her out to his pickup truck, got his two daughters up, and we're talking two and three years old. And they sat, I thought he killed them in the house. They sat in the back of the pickup truck with their mom laying at their feet while he drove an hour away. And them asking, is mom going to be okay? Is mom going to be okay? He had an hour to get to the place where he was going to bury his wife to think about killing those children. And when he got there, he took one, strangled her to death, shoved her in a, an oil tank that had a hole about this big. And then while the other one is screaming in the truck, he goes to get her, does the same thing. That guy is evil. He's got a devil. Um, they don't let people like that out on bond. So he went from jail to prison. And he gets three life sentences. So that if he dies, and by some miracle he's resurrected, he still has to serve another life sentence. And if he dies again and is mysteriously resurrected, he has to serve another life sentence. They pile that on you to let you know there is never going to be a chance that you ever see the light of day outside of a prison cell. Life in prison is exactly what the lake of fire is. It is everlasting punishment for the continuation of your new body that you have, and it never is, we, we, it's called the second death, but it, I haven't really developed the words yet to describe the difference between the second death and the first death, other than the second death, you are aware of your death. Okay, uh, anyway, um, where did I stop reading at? Verse, huh? 25. Uh, I am tormented in this flame. Verse 25, but Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. And you know, there's something in this verse I just now noticed. Just now noticed. With the way the King James is written, they are using the proper English pronouns. The thine, ye, you. Correct? The is second person singular. But notice who Abraham, that, start in verse 25. Abraham said, son, remember that thou, that is second person singular, in thy lifetime, thy lifetime, second person singular, Receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. But then the language changed in verse 26, and beside all of this, between us and you, in the proper English, you is second person plural. He's not just speaking to the rich man, he now is speaking to the entire population of the other side, hell. That's what you is. There is a great gulf fix so that they, plural, which would pass from hence to you, plural, cannot, neither can they, plural, pass to us, plural, that would come from this. I never noticed that until just now. But the language means those 
Pronouns mean something. You doesn't just mean a single person in the King James English. It is always a, more than one person. I don't know what difference it makes, but apparently Abraham is speaking to everybody, both in his bosom and everybody who's in hell. And, and I guess basically t telling them that God has a rule. It doesn't matter if it's Lazarus or King David or myself. We cannot pass over to your side and you cannot pass over to our side. And there again is that idea that once you are there, you're staying there. Huh? It does away with purgatory. It's it absolutely right. Purgatory is not mentioned anywhere in the scriptures. There is not even a hint of it. Uh, I've not studied it out per se. There is, I think, a reference uh, in the, um, oh, what's the books the Catholic Church puts in there? The what? No, Pentateuch is the first five books of Moses. Uh, ap Apocrypha, thank you. My uh, Greek expert back there. It's the Apocrypha, okay? Now, um, turn, to, turn to Isaiah 66. So, hell, um, Jesus said this, he said, a sign will be given to you, and that will be the sign of Jonas. Whereas Jonas was in the whale's belly three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. And you reference Jonah. Where did Jonah say he was? In the belly of hell. So, did Jesus go to hell? And let, let me clarify this. Did Jesus go there to suffer hell for three days. What did he go there to do? To, to preach. Preach the spirits in prison. The, um, the charismatic movement. This was, this was put um, in a book. What's it called? I can't think of it. But it was by Hank Hanegraaff. Um, and he did an expose of the charismatic movement and he used direct quotes from, from um, Hagee, from Copeland, from Joyce Myers, from Kenyon, to all these other charismatic leaders, Creflo Dollar, people like that. Huh? Christianity, Christianity and Crisis. Very good. It's a great book if you ever want to do an ex, if you ever want to look into the charismatic movement and what they believe. Those people are nuts. Because they teach and believe that Christ went to hell and had to suffer three days in hell, burning on fire, in order to purge us from all our sins. Folks, that's blasphemy. And then, of course, Kenneth Copeland making this statement that God told him that a twice-born man died on the cross. And Copeland asked God, God, are you saying that I could have died on the cross? Yep. Kenneth Copeland could have died for your sins. Isaiah chapter 66. Look in verse 22. And if you think that Isaiah is a small picture of the Bible, you're right. 66 chapters, 66 books, and the last chapter deals with the new heaven and a new earth. Look in verse 22, which is how many chapters Revelation has. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, future tense, shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. Now, when there is... Hell is a temporary place. And it will be cast into the lake of fire. 
when God creates the new heaven and the new earth, the old heaven and the old earth are passed away and there is no more sea. And at the final judgment, death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. So all the contents of hell and all those who are died or dead in there are then just like from prison, going from jail to prison, you being held in jail, then you're sentenced, then you're sent to your punishment. Okay, and ask anybody that's ever had to go to jail, was it fun and games? No, it's not. Uh, it's not a good place to be. Uh, but anyway, he says, verse 23, and it shall come to pass that from one new moon to, the, to another, which tells you that yes, there will be a sun, there will be a moon, they're not necessarily needed to gauge, you know, to give us light and, and uh, day and night, but they are there from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh, and why does he say flesh? Because we're given a resurrected body. Come to worship before me, saith the Lord, and they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. For their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched. And they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. To, to, to my knowledge, it is the only part of the new heaven and new earth where there's any negative thing mentioned. There will be a, a visible lake of fire that I believe will be visible to all of those who inhabit the new heaven and the new earth. Um, why do you suppose God is doing it that way? In other words, he's not taking the lake of fire and putting it a jillion miles away so nobody can see it. He's putting it where everybody can pass by it. Why do you think God is doing that? It's a reminder. Okay, that's good. Anybody else? Huh? Yeah? Do what? Y yeah, I, I can see that. We're, we rejoice in that we're not there. Uh, I think it's a memorial, a reminder. This is where you could have been. Now... I've had, I've had people call me troubled, very troubled. Um, you know, my wife is not saved, and I don't think she ever will get saved. And if I die and I see her in the lake of fire, won't I? God said he'll wipe all tears from their eyes. W will I not weep over her? No. Mm -mm. Because... Jesus said it like this. If you love father, mother, son, daughter, wife, anybody, I'm paraphrasing. More than you love me, you're not worthy to be my disciple. And there is no doubt in my mind that in our new bodies and our new heart, that whether or not you see somebody there that was your wife or your son or your daughter or your mom and dad in your mind and in your heart you will confess to the Lord Lord they should have listened they should have listened yes sir I think we're seeing, we see part of that over here yeah you know, because cemeteries Yeah. So you, so you got to, you know, you see part of it. Come on, come on, be saved. You say, I, you know, I, you know, not much I can do about it. We've got to, but come on, you know. Yeah, exactly. Um, we want them to listen. We want them to know. That's why I asked you this morning. Think it. I, I did. I when I told Steve 
that I had basically was trying to sleep one day and all I could see was him in hell he got really t he, he was driving this we had this big box truck that we put all our insulation in he was driving that truck and he told me later on he said if I hadn't been driving that truck I'd have boxed you right upside your head but he he by that time he had realized that what I was trying to tell him I was telling him in love because I did I love Steve I, we we worked good together at first we didn't like each other he was way different than me I was different from him but we learned to love each other and respect one another and care about one another and he saved me from getting fired several times and uh, I did not want him to go to hell and God just laid that on my heart one day and I prayed for him prayed for him prayed for him there was a time when he was very 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 deep in him, in sin he would not look at me he would not talk to me he would have family get-togethers he hated my guts because he knew what I represented and I wasn't in his face all the time with it but God changed him amen don't quit praying for people turn to Deuteronomy 32 here is, here is God, I believe, establishing hell. That's an interesting statement. The man upstairs, John, says, uh, could, it, could it be adding to the torment of those in hell or in the lake of fire as they can see where uh, belief could have gotten them yeah yeah fish jumping up out of water every now and then just to see what the world looks like <laughs> then they go back in Deuteronomy 32, 22, for a fire is kindled in mine anger. So what is this about? It is, hell is about God's anger. Anger over our disobedience and shall burn unto the lowest hell. Now, uh, I heard a preacher preach this one time. I, I can't say that it's 100% true, but it's possible. Um, is is there a hotter are there hotter places than others in hell well he gave the analogy of a lake he said we know the lake of fire is you know is there and in a lake on the surface you have warm water the deeper you go the more intense the water becomes and what colder the water becomes when you have a large fire the fire on the outside of the flames is nowhere near as hot as where the coals are. So the lowest part of hell, according to our understanding, would be the hottest place there is. More intense and more hot than other places. Now, I, again, I can't say this is thus saith the Lord. But it's an interesting point. For a fire is kindled in mine anger and shall burn unto the lowest hell and shall consume the earth with her increase and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. Well, how is the earth going to be destroyed in the last days? By fire. God is going to burn it up. Hell is literally, it's going to burn from the inside out and consume the entire earth then somehow some way the entirety of the heavens ignites and everything i mean i look at it like splitting the atom what happens when you split the atom exactly annihilation total annihilation and the heat is so intense so something similar to that 
It's going to happen in the end days. But God has already started. He's already lit the fire of this world's destruction by creating hell. He created it, number one, because it's His anger. It'll burn to the lowest hell. It will consume everything just like the flood did. And there's no stopping it. 2 Samuel 22, verse 5. He said, when the waves of death come past me, the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. Then verse 6. Here is one aspect of hell that the Bible, you know, I mentioned this morning, they say, well, it's not really fire, it's separation from God. That's the real bad part of hell. No, it's fire. But then also... Everlasting sorrow. Have you ever done something to somebody that you have regretted your entire life? I have. I mentioned here a few weeks ago, and I won't use the word that I used again, but calling, uh, we had a substitute bus driver one day. I was 15, 16 years old. And I just sitting from the back of the bus waiting for him to take off, shouted the N word. And I just, I've never done that. Never called anybody that to their face. And I've regretted that every day of my life. Every time I think about it, I'm going, why did I do that? I've done other things that to this day I regret. But people, if you're going to warn people about hell, be sure to include the fact that if they're not sorry now for things they've done, they're going to be sorry continuously forever. The greatest thing that we can have is if we've offended somebody and we go to them it's like me going to the neighbor lady over here about her child coming and playing over on our property. When I apologized to her and said that her son could come over and play anytime she wants, he wants, her jaw dropped. She stood there staring at me in disbelief. And she said, and from that moment on, Alicia will tell you, we became good neighbors. That changed her whole relationship with this church. Because I, and I felt better knowing that I had been forgiven of what I had done. I felt, I felt great doing that. In hell, the sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me in my distress. I called upon the Lord and cried to my God, and he did hear my voice out of his temple, and my cry did enter into his ears. Now, do not take this verse as, like I was saying this morning, as saying, well, if I get to hell and I realize I don't like it, then I'll just call unto God. I remember years ago, ACDC was going to do a concert here in St. Louis. This was back late 70s, early 80s, and KC95 did an interview with... Uh, Malcolm and Angus Young, the two brothers singers of ACDC, and um, they had them do a little spot. They interviewed them about their songs and their music and everything like that. And he, um, and he said, this is Angus Young here uh, to do a little story about a song we sing called Highway to Hell. And he said, if you think about it, it's pretty boring up in heaven. And so we want that's and sure enough, uh, it wasn't it wasn't Angus Young who was it that died in his vomit. One of the singers, the lead singer, they thought he was he passed out. They'd partied so much he passed out. And they just left him in the limbo overnight, and they said we'll wake him up next morning. And they found him in there dead. He is so drunk he choked on his own vomit and died. And that's where he's been ever since. He's been in hell ever since. And he's finding out that there's not picnic, it's no barbecue, there's no weenie roast down there, it's, no fun, it's not fun and games. He is sorry to this day 
that he sang those songs and made those statements and lived the life that he did. He's been sorry every day since he died and went there. And it's not going to get better. Psalm 9 verse 15. The heathen are sunk down in the pit that they made. Some people say, oh, I can't believe God will create a place called hell and make people suffer. God is God of love. Okay, well, maybe you're the one that dug it. The heathen are sunk down in the pit that they made. In the net which they hid is their own foot taken. The Lord, listen to this. The Lord is known by the judgment which he executeth. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hand. Higion, Selah, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Now, there's several things I want to point out about this. Number one, yes, not just the Lord, but every judge is known by the judgment that they execute. What, what do you suppose would be the result of Hillary Clinton being audited by the IRS concerning their use of funds from the Clinton Foundation? What do you suppose would be the outcome of that trial? Not guilty. Not guilty. There isn't a judge in this country that would take that on. Those people are powerful people. Those people, if you believe the stories and I believe the stories, there is a, there is a stack of bodies that follows the Clintons around everywhere they go. Including Jeff Epstein probably. I watched two forensic accountants give testimony to Congress concerning the Clinton Foundation. They said, we've got the goods on them. And the leader of that little congressional meeting was a Republican. And he said, turn your documents over to us and we'll take a look at them. And they said, no, sir. And he was getting mad. He said, excuse me, you have been ordered by Congress to turn over. See, the IRS has a program that if you're a whistleblower and you, you have investigated uh, one of these nonprofit organizations and you find out that they're guilty of tax fraud, if you turn them in with the evidence and, and the IRS gets paid back what they're owed in taxes and penalties, you as the whistleblower get a portion of that. And they said, uh, with all due respect, we've, been, we've spent the last five years investigating the Clintons. We have this evidence that we're going to send to the IRS so that we can get reimbursed for the time we spent on this. We're not about to give you our documents and get them lost somewhere. And that guy got mad. A Republican. But he's one of these high-ranking guys. Okay? And I'm just telling you, people like that are never going to get judged fairly in this world. Never. So why should God... You listen to this now. Why should God work out a private deal with Matthew that he hasn't worked out with anybody else in the world. That, that was one thing. I remember me and Preacher Golf, uh, this first time I ever met Steve, it was before Lisa and I, it was before we even dated, before we even looked at each other. And uh, Sterling and Gloria were coming here. Lisa was still in high school, I think. And um, Sterling asked if Brother Golf would go out and see Steve. So I went with him and... Steve came up with this, well, I believe I'm just as close to God out fishing on Sunday as I am anything else. That's how he used to talk. Me and God, we've got our own thing going. In other words, him and God had made a new covenant that nobody else, 
That means I can smoke and drink and get high and run around with all the women I want to, but I'm a good guy and I'll still go to heaven. If God did that for one person, he's a dishonest, corrupt judge. You want fairness? You'll get it with God. You don't want man to judge you? Fine, let God judge you, but you're not going to like it. God is known by the judgment that he executeth. That's his reputation, that's his name. And then he says, I don't care what nation they're from. I don't care what color their skin is. I don't care what clothes they wear. I don't care what food they have in the refrigerator. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. So it doesn't matter if you're white, half white, a little pink, a little yellow, a little red, a little tan, a little brown, or totally black. You can only be seen on a bright day when you smile. It doesn't matter. If you are not trusting in Christ as your Savior, you are going to hell. If any nation can gather around the throne of Jesus Christ and sing Hosanna to the Son of David, then any nation can go to hell too. Amen? God is no respecter of persons when it comes to judgment. Queen Elizabeth II will die and go to hell. She calls herself a Christian. She is the head of the Church of England. That doesn't mean snap to God. Her crown, her titles means nothing if she's not given her life and yielded her heart to the Holy Spirit and the Lord Jesus Christ, she will die and sit in the same hell as Charles Manson is right now. Psalm 55, 14. Look at this. Even church members. Psalm 55, verse 14. We took sweet counsel together and walked unto the house of God in company. This is sort of about Judas Iscariot. We walked together and, Judas, you were one of mine. Let death seize upon them and let them go down quick into hell. For wickedness is in their dwellings and among them. And as for me, I will call upon God and the Lord shall save me. It doesn't matter if you were a church member. Church members go to hell every day. Isn't that a shame? In fact, I, if, I was to, if I was to suspect if there actually is a hotter place in hell than there are other places, I would say that the people who knew better would probably end up there as opposed to anybody else. I mean, everybody that doesn't know Christ, they die and go to hell, period, the end. But the people who sat and listened to the word of God every week, boasting of their Christianity, boasting of how good they are, and yet they died lost. Seems like people like that should get it hotter than anybody else. That's just my opinion you don't, have to, you don't have to recite that to God when you stand before him, okay? Proverbs 5. My son, attend to my wisdom and bow thine ear to my understanding that thou mayest regard discretion, that thy lips may keep knowledge. For the lips of a strange woman drop as an honeycomb and her mouth is smoother than oil, but her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. Lest thou shouldest ponder the, the, the path of life, her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. 
If anybody who sits in a church dies and goes to hell, it'll be because Babylon was the spirit that led them there, not the Holy Spirit. Proverbs 7, again, hearken unto me, now therefore, O ye children, and attend to the words of my mouth. Here's your, here's your ticket out of hell. Listen to God's word. Let not thine heart decline to her ways. Go not astray in her paths, for she hath cast down many wounded. Yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Her house is the way to hell. Going, and I can't read the rest of that. I don't know what happened to my... PowerPoint. Anyway, Proverbs 9, a foolish woman is clamorous. She is simple and knoweth nothing. For she sitteth at the door of her house on a seat in the high places of the city to call passengers who go right in their ways. Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. And as for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him, stolen waters are sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But he that knoweth not that but he knoweth not that the dead are there and that our guests are in the depths of hell um, let me get to yeah here here's the part hell and destruction are never full so the eyes of man are never satisfied I commented on pastor Mike online here a few weeks ago about a cartoon that was dreamed up by some gal where she said that hell gets so full every now and then that God sends angels down from heaven to go to hell and eliminate people that are in hell. Kill them. So now there's more room in hell. And this, the main character of this cartoon, and children, were. this caught on. This had like 14, 15 million views amongst like 8 to 12 year old kids. And the hero of the cartoon was a, a, a girl that was in hell that had a hotel that she was going to use to rehabilitate people that were in hell and make them good people. But I'm sorry, Isaiah 5.14 says, Therefore hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure. Can hell grow bigger? Yes! There will never be no more room left in hell. We know that Lucifer is going to be cast down into hell. I'm trying to move through this. And um, I want to I go to this and then I'll stop. Isaiah 28 talks about them making a covenant with death and hell. Now that's a, that's a big question mark in my mind. What is that? I want to know what that is. Probably it has something to do with the mark of the beast is my guess. Okay? Mark chapter 9 verse 43. And I had a Jezebel here one time. Uh, it was Brady's mother-in-law. She, that woman was evil. And they came here, and you could tell she wore the pants and everything else in that house. She was the ruler and supreme goddess of her household. She questioned everything that I said. And... She wanted, she wanted me, to, she wanted to try to get me to say the Bible isn't literal in everything it says. And she quoted this verse. Mark 9, 43, And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched. Now she said, well, that's not literal, is it? If, you're, if your hand sins, you don't cut it off, do you? I said, back up. What does it actually say? Thy hand offend thee, cut it off. If you had uh, a necrotic bacteria in your hand, or something like leprosy, and it was slowly but surely rotting your hand while you were still alive, what's the final best remedy? Cut it off. Why? so that the rest of the body can live. It's better to enter into life maimed than having two hands going into hell. Don't let the rotten hand corrupt the entire body. 
So that family that was here several years ago that started so much trouble. They were kicked out of five churches before they got here. When they left here, they went over to Second Baptist. Brother Jim Waymire called me six months after they got there, and he said, I got a problem with, these, with the Gartner family. And I said, yeah. And the quicker you get them out, the better off you'll be. And he had, a, he had to do a church trial on them and put them out. But that's, what that, that's part of what that means. Uh, and he says, verse 44, Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Did we just read that? In Isaiah 66, Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. For it is better for thee to enter into halt, enter, in, enter halt into life, than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never, never shall be quenched. Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. By the way, the NIV removes, this is mentioned three times here, the NIV, NIV removes two of them. And if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye. Matthew, do you remember Eldon? He always told me, he said, I know why I'm blind. He used to be a sheriff up in Montana. Every man's dream. A sheriff in a county in Montana. He, and he was the Marlboro man. I've seen pictures of him. Cowboy hat, mustache, cigarette. Sheriff of that county. But he was arrogant, cocky, an adulterer, and he knew it. And God took his eyesight to save him. And he knew it. He said, I can see better now than I ever could before. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. You're better, listen, you're better off without some people. You're better off without certain things in your life. You're better off not spending so much time on the internet. You're better off not spending so much time watching television. You're better off spending more time with the Word of God, spending more time in prayer. You're better off that way. There are some things that are killing you, and it's best for you to cut them off and get them out of your life before they destroy the rest of you. Amen? Amen. Let's stand to our feet. Fear not which kill them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. Fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. I got a lot to say about that, but I don't have time. Father, I love you. I thank you for this book. I thank you for the warning that you gave me. Nine years old. A nine-year-old boy doesn't even want to die, much less burn for eternity afterward. God, you knew how to get my attention. You knew how to get me. And I'm not ashamed to say it, and I don't mind you doing it that way at all, God. Because you've given me something far greater than I ever deserve. You've given me eternal life with you in heaven. And Father, even if, even if all you did for me was just annihilate me at the end, even that would be worth living this life and going through what we go through rather than suffering eternity in the lake of fire. God, please, please, Use this church and use these people, all of them here and online, 
to reach somebody and warn them about your judgment that's coming. They may not believe it, but then again, they may come just like Steve Leonard came to me and said, how do I know that I'm not going to hell when I die? God, I'll worship you and serve you for the rest of my life for that one salvation. Because I saw the absolute biggest miracle I've ever seen in my life. Lord, bless these people. Dismiss them. Give them a good week. Give us good work into our hands. Help us to serve you in everything that we do. We love you in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen.